We're heading into the final stretch of the semester with just your capstone project standing between you and your goal of finishing this course. While that's a fantastic milestone, it typically comes with some anxiety so that many of you may be asking, would somebody please tell me what to write? That's perfectly natural. The good news is that there are some guidelines that can help give your writing some direction and structure to your literature review. Before getting to that, though, we need to talk about something called theory of mind. Where are you from? You've answered this question countless times in your life. Have you ever stopped to think, though, that how you answer it depends critically on who is asking? Probably without consciously thinking about it, your brain immediately decides what the person asking the question means by from. Do they mean where you were born, where you graduated from high school, where you're currently living? That simple from can mean all of those things and more. Being able to differentiate between those potential meanings is a remarkable cognitive feat. Even more remarkable, though, is what your brain does next. Namely, it rapidly sizes up the person asking the question. Where is that person from? How familiar are they with your geographical references? How precise did they need your answer to be? Assessing all of those questions happens in a flash and, again, probably happens just under your conscious thought, leading you to variously respond, I'm from Josephine. Or, I'm from a tiny town just northeast of Dallas. Or, I'm from Texas. Or, I'm from the United States. One question, many possible responses, each of which depends not on where you're from, that remains the same, but on an almost subconscious consideration of what your audience needs to understand your answer. We do this all the time. In almost every daily interaction, our brains whirl away in the background, guiding our communication based on its assessment of who it is we're talking to. We're able to do this because of something scientists call theory of mind. Theory of mind is the ability to understand that what's going on in another individual's mind is different from what's going on in our own. As far as we can tell, we are one of the few creatures on Earth with this remarkable capacity. It allows us to imagine another person's perspective, constantly putting us in other people's shoes. It comes as naturally to most people as breathing. Until, that is, they begin writing. For a variety of reasons, many people struggle to apply what comes naturally to them in daily interactions to the formal structure of written communication. This is especially true when it comes to technical writing. Part of this is because beginning technical writers often don't know a lot about the audience they're trying to write to. Another factor, though, is that beginning technical writers become so preoccupied with sounding sciency that they lose sight of their goal, which is to communicate something they understand to people who haven't considered it before. One way to think of it is that beginning technical writers often aren't writing to anyone else, but rather they are writing for themselves, using writing as a way of organizing their own understanding of topics new to them. This is a powerful way to use writing. Indeed, I use it myself. Often, I have no idea what I'm writing until after I've written it. Here's the difference, though, between experienced and beginning writers. Namely, when they reach that eureka moment in their writing, when they finally figure out what it is they're trying to say and for whom, experienced writers will start writing all over again, this time making important writing choices based on what message they want to communicate and a careful consideration of their audience's perspective. Beginning writers often fail to do this. Once they finally figure out what they want to say, they forget that they need to say it to someone else, thus never activating their own theory of mind. By now, most of you should be pretty comfortable with your projects. You should be getting a good grasp about what the scientific community understands about the topic you've chosen. This is fundamentally a good thing. However, it brings with it some pitfalls. Namely, many people become so familiar with their topics that they forget what it was like not to know what they have come to know through their long hours of research. But you're supposed to be writing to inform others, to communicate something important that they've probably never thought about, at least not to the depth you've been considering it. When you're writing, you need to put yourself in the shoes of your readers and consider what is it they need to know in order to understand your argument. 
And this brings us back to our starting question, where are you from? Again, how you answer this question depends critically on who you're talking to. Particularly, it depends on shared context. If you're both equally familiar with the area you're from, you can be at once extremely precise and brief. If the person asking the question is only passingly familiar with where you're from, you will need more words to explain yourself, more reference points to orient and direct them. You may also need to be less precise depending on why the person asked the question. If they are asking out of idle curiosity, does it matter that they know exactly what small town you're from or which neighborhood in a large city? Probably not. On the other hand, if you want them to meet you at your home, then it's pretty important you provide them the information they need to get there. And if that person doesn't know anything at all about where you're from or the surrounding region, then no matter how much detail you provide, they're never going to know precisely where you're from. Technical writing is no different. For your capstone project, you're writing to a scientific audience. This means that your readers share enough context with you that you don't need to explain all the basics. However, just because somebody has deeply studied the genetics of heart disease in horses for 15 years doesn't mean that they will be familiar with all the latest developments in the field of heart disease in dogs. And neither of them are likely to be familiar with ongoing research on, say, the treatment of pancreatic cancer, even though they're perfectly capable of understanding the science. People unfamiliar with your project need more context than you do, and you need to always keep that in mind as you're writing. As discussed earlier, writing for understanding, writing to help you get a grasp of your topic, is important and powerful. That's why I've structured the assignments in Vibs 310 the way I have. In particular, the Memo Annotated Bibliography is your chance to get your thoughts on paper, help you work through your project, and find direction. Although formerly you were writing that project with me as your intended audience, you were really just writing that for yourself. Your task with the literature review is to communicate the thoughts and arguments you developed for the memo with the wider scientific community. In short, now you're writing for somebody else. I find it helpful when making that transition to start thinking about the end of my draft and work my way back to the beginning. In other words, start your plan for writing by considering what you want your audience to know when they reach the end of your paper. For this assignment, you want your audience to agree with you that the unknown you've identified, the gap you've pointed out in the scientific literature, is important and worth further research. That means, of course, that you need a firm grasp of your unknown in the first place. Once you do, then you can take half a step back and ask yourself, what information does my audience need in order to understand what the unknown is and why it's important? Now you can take one more step back and ask yourself, what information is needed to orient your audience to the topic in the first place? For instance, if you've chosen a topic related to a disease like type 2 diabetes or breast cancer that almost everyone is familiar with, then you don't need to provide as much background information to put your project into context. On the other hand, if you've chosen an obscure disorder such as methemoglobinemia or Kuru, you'll need more background to orient your readers. The same kind of thinking needs to guide each part of your literature review all the way to the end. Fortunately, structure can help guide you through this process. Just as abstracts follow predictable patterns, so do literature reviews. These patterns aren't quite as obvious or formalized as with abstracts, but they're there nevertheless, and they can provide a kind of loose outline of steps for you to follow. A few points before we dive in. First, don't worry about the names I use for the various parts of the literature review. I've borrowed or adapted most of them from an article I came across years ago in the journal English for Specific Purposes. The examples I provide come from that paper. Ultimately, the names are arbitrary. What matters is the function each part serves. Second, not every literature review will have every single one of the steps that I will outline. In fact, some of them are mutually exclusive, representing different approaches authors take to solving the same rhetorical problem. In the end, which steps to include and how to arrange them will depend critically on what makes sense for your project. Nevertheless, knowing what choices you have should help you organize your own literature review. Finally, it is tremendously helpful if you look for these steps in some of the articles you've been using for your research. 
I therefore strongly recommend that once you're finished watching this video, you pick one or two of your favorite articles and see which steps you can find. You may be tempted to skip this step, but it will make what you need to do for your own capstone project much easier. You're going to open your literature review with a kind of announcement, a protracted argument that says, this is what I'm studying and it's important. In a previous video, we talked about the size of the human body of knowledge, and we visualized it as a stack of CD-ROMs stacked from the Earth to the Moon and part way back. In light of that volume of information, literature reviews usually start with some statement that orients the reader to where in that vast stack of information the paper will fall, basically placing a big you are here sign at the start of your paper. Most often, this is a simple statement of what the topic you've chosen is central to. What models or processes or phenomena does this topic affect? That's where you need to begin your literature review. Here we have two examples taken from the published literature. In the first example, protein degradation plays an important role in a wide array of cellular events. We know right away that this literature review is going to be about protein degradation and that protein degradation is important to many different cellular processes. In the second example, iron sulfur cluster prosthetic groups play a key role in a wide range of enzymatic reactions, as well as serving as regulatory switches. We know right away that this literature review is about iron sulfur clusters, which are important to enzyme kinetics and gene regulation. In thinking about your project then, what is your topic central to? Once you can answer that question, you'll have a strong start to your literature review. Once you orient the reader to where they are, it's a good idea to refresh their memories. Broadly speaking, what did they need to know in order to understand your project? Yes, you're writing to a scientific audience, but you can't assume they know what you know or that they will automatically recall the relevant aspects of your project that will put your work into the proper context. In other words, you need to activate your theory of mind. One way of looking at this is to imagine yourself using a stick to draw a map in the dirt for a friend. You might start with a large circle saying, this is the park. That's a bit like step one. Step two then, orient your reader within that larger circle. Thinking of our dirt map, you might draw a box with your stick saying, this box then is the fountain at the north end. From there, you follow the path to, and then you'd walk your friend through your map to whatever destination you have in mind. In the first example here, the hammerhead ribozyme is arguably the best characterized ribozyme, the author orients the reader to the fact that the hammerhead ribozyme has been well characterized. Presumably, if we read further, the author would review some of its relevant characteristics. Moving on to the second example, protein export pathways are less well characterized, although in this example, by contrast, the author starts by acknowledging that not a lot is known about protein export pathways, but then most likely goes on to tell us what we do know about them. Note how this sets the literature review up to move from broad generalizations to specifics. We will talk a bit more about this later, but you should think of your entire literature review as a funnel that catches the attention of people from many different perspectives and directs that attention to some specific, narrow point you want to highlight. While I wouldn't argue that steps one and two are optional, it's not at all uncommon for authors to skip one of them. In many cases, they can be used almost interchangeably. However, every introduction, every paper will have step three, reviewing previous research. That's precisely why we call them literature reviews in the first place. To get a better grasp of how to manage this part of your own literature review, Pay close attention to the transitions authors of published papers use to start their reviews of previous research. As the examples here show, it's usually pretty direct. In the first example, we read that double-stranded RNA induces cellular responses in diverse systems. If we were to read further, we'd undoubtedly read about some of those diverse systems. In the second example, we read that movement of lipid and protein components between organelles requires the regulated interactions of many molecules. Presumably, the authors then launch into a description of what those molecules are. Usually, step three will be the longest part of the introduction. That simply stands to reason. 
it takes space to move your audience from the broad you are here statements at the beginning of your literature review to the specific unknown you are arguing needs to be researched next. Again, you should keep in mind that you're always moving in your literature review from broad to specific. The only exception will be if your unknown centers on a controversy in the field. In that case, you'll need to adequately describe each side of the debate. Even in the case of controversies, though, you'll generally describe each position starting with broad generalizations, drilling down to the specifics that are relevant to your project. You may not have thought much about it as you've been reading the papers for your project. However, every single introduction to every paper you've read so far is an argument for what work needs to be done next to improve our understandings of the topic under consideration. There are basically two ways to approach this move. The first approach to arguing for your unknown is simply to state what the unknown is in light of all the knowledge claims you've made up to this point in the literature review. In the first example on the slide, the author states flatly that no one has characterized how the 184 nucleotide 6S RNA is processed from its precursor. That's a pretty straightforward gap. No one has done this yet. In the second example, the author argues that the relationship between the catalytic mechanism of this enzyme and other members of its superfamily is unclear. Clarifying that relationship would help fill in a gap in our understanding. Before moving on, it's important to realize that there are many types of unknowns. The simplest, for instance, is a knowledge deficit. In other words, no one has looked at the problem identified in the literature review. Another type of unknown is a shortcoming in the scholarship. Most often, this is methodological. For instance, perhaps a drug has been extensively tested, but only in men. Or perhaps what we understand about a psychological phenomenon comes exclusively from studies on college-age students attending American universities. These would be obvious shortcomings in the field that need to be addressed. Sometimes the unknown rests on a controversy in the field. The literature contains contradictions that need to be resolved. In these cases, authors will usually try to focus on one small part of the controversy, something that, once understood, could help resolve some of the contradicting opinions. Finally, sometimes there is a gap in our understanding because current research rests on unfounded or untested assumptions. In that case, testing those assumptions would be the unknown that the scientific community needs to address. A classic example of this was that, for years, the medical community assumed that heart attacks in women presented the same symptoms as heart attacks in men. Eventually, someone challenged this assumption and found out that physicians had been missing and even dismissing heart problems in women. It's hard to even imagine what damage that unfounded assumption caused through the years. Importantly, which category your unknown falls into will affect how best to indicate the gap for your project. Another way to argue for your unknown is simply to ask it as a question. These examples demonstrate this approach. The key as yet unresolved questions in analysis of double-stranded RNA-associated PTGs are one, why are both strands required in the trigger RNA? And two, how can double-stranded RNA exert an effect with concentrations that are substantially lower than those in the endogenous target RNA? Or, as we see here in the second example, is conformational stability a determinant of ribonuclease cytotoxicity? In the end, which approach you take to your literature review is a matter of personal preference. These steps are just guidelines. They are not absolutes. You should organize your literature review in a way that makes sense for your project. Nevertheless, thinking about the literature review in terms of these different parts can help you organize your thoughts. At each step, remember to put yourself into your reader's shoes. Anticipate what questions or points of confusion they might have and provide them with the context they need so that by the end of your literature review, they understand what the unknown is that you're trying to address and they agree that it's an important gap that needs to be filled in. As a final note, literature reviews are structured a bit weird. Almost all of you are accustomed to the structure represented here. You expect that the papers you read will start from broad topic generalizations and then narrow down to a concrete specific thesis. You then expect that much of the paper will elaborate on that thesis. Finally, you expect some kind of wrap-up something that takes you from the narrow concerns set up by the thesis back to a broader perspective. You're familiar with this because it's been hammered into you since at least high school. It's the classic five-part paper. It's also how complete journal articles are structured. 
the introduction goes from broad to specific. The methods and results develop linearly from there, and the discussion develops from the specific findings of the study to their broader implications. However, we're not asking you to write an entire journal article. We're only asking you to write the introduction. As such, you're going to go from broad to specific and then stop. This structure is often called the inverted pyramid. It's actually common, especially in journalism. Even so, if you're not used to it, the inverted pyramid feels weird and uncomfortable. Just run with it though, it's exactly what we're looking for. There you have it then. We've covered a lot of ground, starting with theory of mind and how you can use that to improve your communication. We then turned our attention to how theory of mind has helped create an underlying structure to literature reviews, a structure that you can use as a loose outline as shown here. You'll begin by orienting your readers and directing their attention. You'll tell them where they are. You'll give them some generalizations about your topic so they can get their bearings. You'll then review what the scientific community understands about your topic. Finally, you'll make an argument for the unknown, either by indicating a gap or by raising a question. And then, as odd as it will feel, you'll stop. I hope this information is useful. Remember, be gentle with yourselves and kind to one another. Thanks for watching.